So our purpose at Morehouse is to create a safer world by helping companies improve their force and torque measurements. So a little bit more background about us. Uh, we do have a calibration laboratory where we offer force and torque calibrations at a very high level of accuracy. Uh, we are a primary standards laboratory and offer deadweight calibrations for up to 120,000 pounds of force known to within 0.002% of applied force. We also offer other force calibrations up to 2.25 million pounds or 10 meganewtons of force known to within 0.01% of applied force. Although, uh, you know, we're talking a lot about force calibration today, I also do want to mention our torque calibration lab. Uh, we do have a torque lab, which was purchased from the National Physical Laboratory in England. Uh, and for torque, we have uncertainties better than 25 parts per million. So with that little bit of background about the company, I am going to pass it over to our presenter today, who is Henry Zumbrum. He's been the president of Morehouse since 2013 and worked at Morehouse for more than 20 years. Henry has a passion for measurement accuracy and reducing risk associated with measurements that impact the safety in our daily lives. One thing I've learned from Henry is just about the far reaching impact of force measurements on everything from the planes we fly in to the bridges we ride on and the cars we drive in. So now I'm gonna pass it over uh, to Henry for the presentation. Yeah, thanks Heather. So there's my contact information. If there's any questions that come up later, you will have the PDF free to reach out to me, whatever your preferred contact method is, whether it's uh, also on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, whatever it is, uh, LinkedIn uh, or emails is usually preferable by me, but uh, any way you wanna reach me, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, as Heather said, we are here to help. Outcomes for today, we'll learn a, uh, about problems that exist when calibrating force measuring instrument, adapters that reduce errors, and how to get the best uncertainty from a universal cal machine. We'll have a polling question that asks everybody if they're interested in an additional webinar. We do have some guidance documents online, a uh, new website launched, and we have guidance documents on how to do uncertainty budgets for UCMs. I believe that document's 30 some pages. Uh, we could do a webinar and walk people through. So we'll, we'll ask that question later if that's of, of interest to people. Uh, as of now, we have about an hour to go over things. Typical, uh, you know, things we're going to go over here are some calibration headaches, some uh, error sources in force calibration, adapters that reduce these errors, and then some UCM uncertainty, which is only a little piece of it to kind of show uh, what's going on and what we can do and that we have this other guidance document. We talk about calibration headaches. Uh, manufacturers have not standardized their instruments, right? So if you buy a 10,000 pound load cell uh, and somebody else has a 10,000 pound load cell, so there might be different thread sizes. One might be 5 eighths, 18. One could go an inch and a quarter. All variables, uh, the bottom adapters, the whole size on tension lengths, everything. Nothing is really standard. And what, what did the manufacturer do to test how are they getting their specification? When they say something is accurate to X, how are they getting it, right? Is this achieved once, never repeated? Is this a conservative estimate? Is it, is it just an estimate where they're taking averages, which some do? So what we start looking at is, okay, we have this calibrating machine and we have these adapters. If we keep that line of force pure, free from the eccentric forces, we're gonna do the right thing. So. That's part of the headache is I have all these instruments. I want to set up a Cal lab and I have all these instruments that are that could come in. And how am I going to calibrate them? So that's that's where we have the adapters. So the, the headaches range from the setups, missed revenue opportunities. You know, maybe somebody has something uh, that you know you wanna they want to send in and you don't have it. Costly reference standard dual mode calibrations. That's a picture over here. We'll talk about all of these. Unidentified errors. Hey, I, I have a technician that's making measurements. They think they're good to go. They've done four weeks of measurements, and then you find out, no, this device should be loaded through top and bottom threads every single time. That's how it's designed. That's how it's to be used in the field. This is where we can help with guidance. This is where, you know, talking to your customer, understanding and replicating use. Time-consuming rework. That happens when you have the technicians making errors. That happens when you don't have the right adapters when somebody's trying to get something right. You know, talk to a technician. 
They'll talk about, and we have this coming up, they'll talk about butt and load tests. Oh, I hate those things. I did this and that. So assumptions on the calibration accuracy. Customer calls in, a potential customer calls in and says, hey, I need you to calibrate the device and I need you to be four times more accurate. Oh, that, that makes me want to vomit in, in itself when people start, you know, when we're talking about TARs and all, all of that. And we have an article coming out about TAR uh, should be RIP ASAP, but we'll... But it's still used. So how do you do it? How how do you make sure your device is that good? If you're using different fixturing and adapter, we'll talk about all that. So let's talk about those button load cells. This is a headache for everybody. Typical setup is on the left, right? And if you're using these, your technicians are going to be crying. I don't. I can't get these in from one cal to the next. Everything you know, the alignment. I get this in. I did this calibration. Hey, manager, I did this calibration. And then I went to do it again and a half an hour later and it's different. Or this thing comes back every six months. Every time it comes back, we're adjusting it for the customer. That's a problematic setup. So this is where adapters and we have solutions for all these setups. Uh, to the left, uh, if, if we're looking at this picture, you have the setup. Hey, I'll just put a flat piece of steel on it, load it flat and see what I get. And then to the right, you have a line with adapter. We've showed uh, we've shown this before this uh, slide before, but in general, it's part you're you're doing this button load cell. You have the proper adapters. You can see the difference with the data. Now the manufacturer may spec it, or the customer say, "I want 0.1 percent of full scale." That that's not going to happen. But on the left here, manually align. We're doing rotations. We're doing everything. You can see the standard deviation of three measurements is 10 pounds. Maximum deviation was 21. My percent error is 1.045. You do the same test where you rotate it around, randomize the loading condition with the adapter. Now we're getting a standard deviation of two, uh, a max deviation of four, and a percent error of less than 0.2%, or 199. That's a 525% improvement. That's a lot of improvement from just using the right adapters. They can be aligned in the cow machine in the base, and the technician can do it with confidence, right? That loads, that button cell can come in, they can select the right adapters, they can apply the forces, and they can be confident in the results and what they are getting. And that's a headache, right? If I'm not confident, how many times am I going to redo it? How upset am I going to get as a technician? Think about it. We, you know, we think about employees. Uh, now in the news, it's hard to get employees and employee motivation. What the biggest thing to demotivate most employees is just continually doing work where there's questioning the results, right? I, what do you do each day? I come to work, I do calibrations. I don't know if any of them are good or not. I'm getting all kinds of variation. That's not a very good uh, motivational factor. Most people want to do work. They come to work, they want to do well, and they want to do their job right. So these adapters uh, with the machine certainly help that. Vision. Missed revenue opportunities. Here we put in our scale press. This is on UCMs, but we have a scale press. It's designed to calibrate scales. The universal cal calibrating machine was designed to do tension lengths, strain scales, almost anything we could throw at it. But if we made it to do scales, that machine would get so big and it would just take so much steel and get so costly. And it's just not a good thing uh, as far as design wise to make a UCM that's as big as the scale press. So this on the on the right is is for air, aircraft scales. That is a difference. Um, the the cow machine can do some scales, but it's very limited with the footprint that's on it. So if you want to get those, you know, the scales from all the manufacturers, GC, Intercom, all of those, the big aircraft scales, the big thing there is with adapters is to make sure you replicate the tire print. If it's an eight by eight, 12 by 12, 11 by 17, we want to make sure we have those right adapters that best replicate the tire. Um, so we can do almost everything in the UCM, but not scales. Um, and we actually had somebody that wanted to, to make a machine to do both. And it, it just was more expensive than buying two separate machines, honestly. So universal testing machine, um, also known as a universal testing. These are materials testing machine, pre pre test frames. Some people use these for force measurements. It's, again, it depends on what you want to do for accuracy. They have that, they're very rigid. That's good for them. But most machines are between 0.3 and 1%. Uh, errors of less than a half percent are not uncommon. Very few labs can calibrate the devices sufficient, more accurate than uh, a quarter percent. The very best machi machines, like the Tinius Olsen, uh, 
Super L. Very best machines uh, like a Tinius Olsen Super L can achieve about that 0.1%. Still not good. At, that's your best starting point. Typically, that's still not good enough for what your customers are expecting, especially if they want your uncertainties to be a lot better. And we start talking about risk and conformity assessment, all that good stuff. Those numbers do not relate well to what most expectations we've seen, even on those butt and load cells and, and whatnot uh, that are out there. So just wanted to say people use them. Uh, calibration and measurement capability is typically above 03. A uh, universal test machine may be used to apply a force of well-defined reference standard. That means you put a load cell in there. Uh, the machine by itself is not good enough to calibrate other things. If you put a reference load cell in it and use the machine to control the reference, you get better and maybe you can get about 05. We've seen labs do that. Not the greatest way to do the cows, but it would work if you're really on a budget and, and want to use a dual purpose machine. Then we start dealing with another machine, uh, these dynamic cow machines. Manufacturers are making them. Not a bad machine, but you're typically, you're looking at CMCs of better than uh, 0.05, uh, not as well suited for calibration of all equipment. Uh, often calibrate quickly, which is a big plus, but then they don't hold the forces. So a lot of standards, ISO 376 requests require that at least the force is held for 20 seconds or more. So. Uh, they also tend to cost two to three times more than a comparable UCM. Uh, the recurrent calibration cost is higher as they require the reference standard to be calibrated in both tension and compression. So our UCM, the standards in compression only, these are compression and tension, carries a higher ownership cost. And like I said, not against them, they just, they go fast. And if you're in, if you're doing load cells per, per production, or if you can standardize that you're only going to receive X, uh, X load cell and it's this range because you still have a problem of changing standards. They go from about 10% of capacity up to capacity. So if you had this machine's 55,000, if you had a 50,000 pound force load cell, you could calibrate it from 5,000 to 50. If the customer expectation is to go lower, now you have to change out standards, which is, you know, again, more cost, um, and because your CMCs are higher, more cost, ISO 376, loading range isn't gonna be as good, very, not, not really well suited for that. So we just go on and on about these. If, as I said, very good choice, if you're running a production line, or if you have the same can standardize, hey, I just have 50,000 pound um, X manufacturer load cells I want to calibrate all day long. That's all my fleet has. I don't have this requirement for any variability. Really, really good machine as far as that goes. Um, uh, the other thing, one of the best tests. So if you have these machines, one of the best tests to say how good is this? Because we've seen claims of, of ridiculous claims that that are much low. We've seen conservative. We've seen people using them with conservatives uh, uncertainty statements and people using them with not so conservative uncertainty statements. And the best thing to say, if, hey, if I'm claiming an 03 or even an 05 is to do an ILC with good reference standards, or I can do my own ILC where I can take two of these load cells pictured here and calibrate them with deadweight primary standards, and then I can compare them against each other. And you know what? The difference that you see between those two calibrated with primary standards is really a representation of your true capability. The proficiency tests on the market today are not as good as taking two standards calibrated with dead weight, which is called dissemination error, putting them together and seeing what the difference is. That's going to really tell you if you're in with, with your claimed uncertainty or not. So then we get to the universal cow machine. Versatile, easy to use machine. You know, they've been in existence since the, the 50s. Uh, and, and a lot of them are still in existence that were used in the 50s. What happens is the motor burns out or you get some seals. Uh, quite honestly, what happens is people tend to misuse them for years and years. They get divots, they need reground, and then they just become, you know, when a machine's, you know, 650, 60 years old and hasn't been used properly, it's a lot easier to just make a new one than taking it all apart and refurbishing it uh, completely. If you, if you watch uh, Pawn Stars or watch uh, Rick's Restoration or any of those shows, often pretty expensive to... Uh, fix up some of these, or if you're into cars, if you have an old car, it's you, most people put more money in an old car 
just because of a hobby than buying a new one. So it, it's the same comparison with that. Accuracy, the machine matches the accuracy of the reference standard. Most machines are aligned well enough uh, that maximum amount of side load is less than 0.0625 in inches. And on a shear web load cell, that mounts to a possible error of 0.003%. What's, what's nice about this uh, machine, so to speak, is the simple, the simple fact here, I got my highlight working, that when we calibrate this, our yoke, everything here in this box, when we calibrate it, that cell, we calibrate it exactly as it showed. The yoke is the same type of same type of calibration on our dead weight machine. We calibrate it with a ball adapter. So you place it in the machine and it's used exactly how it's calibrated. So that is why we say it matches the reference standard. Though there are some additional uncertainties like the side loading and some other things. But really, you have a really good reference standard. You're going to add very little else in this machine. Uh, CMCs typically 02 to 03. Most customers, when, when they come to our training or go to our uh, training course or we help them out, they do the repeatability test. They do everything else, reproducibility. They do all of these tests and then they end up with a CMC depending uh, on where it is, typically between 02 and 03. And then a Morehouse UCM with two to three load cells can uh, achievable CMCs of better than 01% throughout the loading range. This is the trade-off moment here. People are here, and this is where I have an audience that I get to talk to talk to them about. If you really want to drive that uncertainty down, you're changing standards. And then you have time loading profile changes and other things associated with it. So if you want the best, you probably want to go to dead weight. Dead weight's super expensive. Maybe there's a compromise with two load cells and getting like an O2. Um, but that's how you want to, you really want to decide how you want to operate standard changes, all of that other stuff, uh, which we could talk about in the UCM. So what makes a good force machine? Really, uh, it's going to be to minimize off-center loading, bending, and torsion. To do this, they need to be plumb level or square rigid. People go out and buy a Harbor Freight press and say, hey, I'll put a load cell in there. Well, that's usually not plumb level, square rigid, and, and sometimes it has a lot of torsion. So be wary, homemade machines, people don't understand some of this. Oh, this will work. But they end up introducing all this additional error and they don't do the ILC or the proficiency test to know that they actually have the error. So that's a lot of hidden. We've done all the tests in the Cal machines. So we know that our errors are really, really low when it comes to comparing two standards calibrated in dead weight against each other. So picture to right, here's 100K UCM, upper and lower flat and a ground flat. Adjustable feed allows end user to obtain level condition. If level is not achieved, and this is a big disclaimer here, you can level the machine, but if you decide not to do it, you're gonna have high errors. That's with any force machine. Easy operation, simple yoke moment and fine adjust control. Reference standard always in compression, reduced errors from misalignment. And then we have all these videos uh, there. So it's really your reference standard only needs to be in compression. You know, that calibration is much less expensive than a compression intention. Not to mention, you're conditioning that reference standard. So it's always in, you don't have to do the switch. That material is never being pulled on. So it's going to be more uniform. It's going gonna, it's gonna to repeat a lot better. That load cell only sees compression for its lifetime. You don't have to switch and then re-exercise, do everything else. No, it's going to condition. It's going to become really flat and as it, it, when I say really flat, that goes for from one calibration to the next. After like the first year or two, this thing is going to be with the right system. Uh, the load cells drift is going to be very much minimized, and part of that is because we're only loading it in one direction. Um, yeah, and then you have the the rigidity of it. It's designed newer machines. Those that bought machines eons ago that are still using them. Just know on the newer machines here, we have, because of the plumb level square rigid, we have made the machines wider to accommodate more. And this piece right here, these, these uh, yokes, we've made those thicker on the newer machines for rigidity to reduce the bending. Same with our uh, scale press machine. We've made that uh, more rigid than it had been in the past. What about machines, some hidden errors, things you may see. All of these um, are additional errors that we talk about in a longer class. So we have a paid for class coming up in October. Registration is online. 
Uh, that is going to be a virtual class. We're also going to start opening up in person uh, later on, but we talk about all these errors and, you know, we have some videos, proper pin size with tension links, misalignment, thread depth, uh, button washer cells, hardness of top plates. The main part, dual range calibration errors, having TR that is lower than one to one, what that means, timing errors, ascending versus descending, errors of used batteries. All of these things can be time sucks. You know, this is where you do upfront and contracting, right? Ask your customer how they're using it and then get the right adapters to replicate that and understand what they're doing. If they're if they're using something on five volt excitation and all you have is 10 volt DC standard, make them send the meter in. It's gonna be so much better. Uh, there's things like not following published standards. That's a big no-no. If you, if you have a calibration provider that's not doing the switch for two cells, so you can't get, uh, you know, a lower force limit that's lower, or you can't use it if their first point is 10%. They can't assign ranges that are below that. So there's there's a lot of different things out there that you have to be wary of and do your due diligence. Uh, we talk about all that in our classes. And then you start talking about the error sources. Here's a sheet, and this comes from the classes, and, and basically this is this is showing the additional error contributions from all these sources, not using the right plate size. These are done internal class. We would go through these one by one. We have an Excel sheet where we can put them in and see what it does to our risk uh, profile. So just wanted to show that there is things to consider, things you can absolutely, things you can control, right? Not using the right size scale plate, you can control that. You can buy the right size plate. Bolting a load, load cell, that's some torque specification. Traction dynamometer uh, in the cow machine. This one really needs special adapters because the error is about 8%. If you take off those shackles and put them in the cow machine, and we have we do have adapters with pressed in bearings, but you don't use those bearings, 8% error. Tension links pin size could be a 0.2% error. Cable, four wire versus six wire, 0.1%. Non-flat base, you can have three, four times the error, five times the error, and so on. Um, you know, the different timing profiles, that might be a, you know, a, a 0.01, 10 volt versus five volt. Typically that's, that, that error is pretty uh, less than 0.01. So, but they all add up, right? And here, here's where we see uh, common error uh, sources for force calibration include not replicating via calibration how the equipment is used. That is the number one. You don't talk to your customer, and you assume something and then you find out they're using it differently now they it's passed the risk is passed to them now they're making bad measurements what if they're making measurements for an auto for brakes uh we've had this happen for uh they have a load cell they're making measurements on a on a tester for brakes for your car what happens when thousands upon thousands of brakes go out bad it hits consumer equipment and you start hearing about it on the news. Mass recalls usually happen and they're very, very expensive. So that's just one example of several other ones. Here's uh, over here, we highlighted, here's the ASTM thing uh, where it's kind of said something. Theoretical class A loading range is 192 pounds here, but since 500 was the first point, you can't assign a lower limit uh, below that. That's per ASTM, there's the sections, it's in section 18 as well. Unidentified error sources, there's torque bolting, uh, there's batteries, there's loading loading profile here. Three pound difference on 25,000 from loading it against the, the bottom, loading it through versus this. I mean, there's all these considerations, right? Using different size adapters than what was used, loading against the bottom thread, temperature effects on non-compensated uh, force instrument, using electrical instruments that were not used during calibration, excitation voltage cabling shielding difference of, yeah different all kinds of error sources that that are really here and then what the the main thing is that there are adapters available and the nice thing about us i you know those that know me i don't talk about more else that much we get in those webinars we post a lot of stuff on linkedin it's all about helping people but the real nice thing about us and and why morehouse is these adapters here's a patent pending um Actually, we got a patent approval. We're just waiting for our, our patent to come through. Here's, here's a clevis set. And we made one clevis with various pin sizes. If you have this in your lab, a tension link walks in, there's like 95% chance that 
our basic set can can do this. If you get our expanded set, which has like 16 or 17 pins, now you go to like a 99% probability that whatever walks in your door, you'll be able to do it with a, with whatever that potential customer sends. And not only that, the person that's doing the cal can just look at the reference and say, hey, I have a Dylan EDX this, I, it takes a 50 millimeter pin, no problem. That's pin number 17 in my set, let's go put it in, that type of thing. Most of these adapters, the other nice thing is most of these adapters are that are common are stocked, so you can order them and have them quickly. So if you need something, you have us, that doesn't happen everywhere. So, and these adapters, they reduce measurement error. And we said, I said earlier, the eccentric force. If we look at this, the main, the main loading axis, anything that's not center is eccentric, right? It's, it's a force that shouldn't be there. The actual load line, Maybe if you use wrong adapters or your tech doesn't use an alignment plug or some other things for the best alignment in these machines, or you have an out alignment condition you're using a testing machine and someone's just visually doing it, you might have, you know, uh, a quarter inch. That's probably real exaggerating. You might have an eighth of an inch, a sixteenth of an inch misalignment, and that's going to throw some errors uh, depending on the instrument. Keeping the line of force pure, different adapters can change the alignment and the amount of strain, hardness. And this is why force calibration is complex. It's why not everybody's in it. It's because the mechanical inter interactions of not using the proper adapters can produce significant errors. And when we say significant, we've already started throwing some out, like a you know one percent error, a 0.2. And you know we provide adapters that give a calibration technician the highest probability of meeting the specifications. That's what that's the takeaway. Morehouse provides the highest probability. Not to say we always do it, but we provide the highest probability or we like to think we do. So some additional errors, incorrect loading condition here. Well, it's not really incorrect. The problem here is without this adapter, you're in the force lab, a customer has a cell with, if they don't send their adapter, the depth of the thread engagement determines the output of the load cell. So, the conversation needs to be, hey, what are you using on top? Are you loading against the shoulder? Do you have a one inch? Are you putting one inch engagement on there? That discussion often raises a lot of eyebrows and the same is true for tension. How much engagement do you have? Are you loading it tight? How tight? Hand tight? Well, can I replicate hand tight? So once we start having these discussions, we know, hey, we, we really need to figure out to standardize our process here. If someone sends this type of load cell and without the adapter, I don't want to send a cal out that's going to give them a half percent error. I want to know what they're doing so I can get that error down so they can replicate it within like a 0.01 or a 0.02. Uh, that's what the goal is. Now, if they lock an internal stud in there, they repeat within, you know, we could repeat all day long. That's a different story. That's the best solution to that equation is lock something in there, pull on it and push on it with it locked in. Then we have varying hardness and flatness of top adapters. This top adapter, seen errors of, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. It's just when you buy the load cell and buy the top adapter with it, it is a system. So you're not going to see any of those errors from different hardness. It's going to wear as it wears over time. It might get a little harder, but it's going to wear with the load cell. You're fine. Uh, tension links, improper pin size. It's all over the place with us. You know, there's a 0.2%. We have a demonstration where we show 0.2% error. You can do that in your lab. Take a tension link and load it with two different sizes. You'll see a huge difference. Right here, more on tension links. Uh, there's a 1.72% error uh, just loaded with and with without the proper pin size. Uh, there it is, 860 pounds. Some other sources, someone doesn't have the stuff they want to use. They use a bent rod end. There's a grade eight bolt uh, that failed. Some of our earlier adapters used the, you know, we'd machine on grade eight bolts uh, just because they were strong and you need to know. And then bad things happen. There's the bridge in Minnesota that collapsed. That was a gusset plate issue, but who tested it? Where did they test it? Did someone do a calibration on something misaligned, then calibrate the machine that then calibrated the plate? Who knows? It's, it's things to consider. What you do today, the measurements you make, make a huge difference. And things to consider, the output of the force measuring device can be significantly impacted by adapters, which pose serious safety concerns and can impact your measurement uncertainty. You know, some of the things 
if you're sitting there with old adapters, the lifespan of them. How many times have they been loaded? Eccentric force and side loaded, side loading. Calibration setups that do not replicate application. Said it several times, gonna keep saying it. Permanent material deformation. Is someone using something that's beat up? Uh, not using ISO 376 recommendations for tension loading. ISO 376 is a is an international standard. It has a nice annex on what you should do for tension loading. Introducing unwanted bending or torsion. Would you know you introduced it in your machine? If we examine the safety concerns with using older adapters and we discuss some of those error sources, we can start seeing like ways to solve them. Here's proper adapters for tension links. Right? Uh, we have clevis kits. Like I said, that'll do this. But if you look at the sheets, you look at the sheets here, it says, hey, this one uses a two inch pin and this one uses a 197 inch pin. One, that's actually a 50 millimeter pin. There's going to be a difference. A lot of people are going to say, that's minute. I can just use the same pin. We've done it. Some of the times you're out of tolerance because you're using a too small or too large pin. So it's really, really important for you as a Cal Lab to replicate that. You can set these up. Here's a here's here's our here's our kit. It since has grown. I think one more one more um, pin that's that was added for a weird model number. But anyway, the black's oxide treated part of the problem with adapters is rust and corrosion. That's why they get. That's why all our adapters have uh, black oxide treating. And then if you have this, a technician can just go to a sheet and reference what they what needs to be used. Um, advantages of Cal machines, uh, tension adapter, quickly switch to calibrate different instruments without disassembling the entire setup. If you have multiple tension links that come in, if you have a tension link in a load cell, improves accuracy and work workflow. I'm a big fan of lean. I've been a fan of lean for a while, not eating lean. That's I'm also a fan of that, but uh, those that know me, I don't always do that, but really a fan of lean setup, which means, you know, what are my times how long does it take a technician to set things up you know it's it's that setup cost right if i have to constantly pull an adapter out put a new one in do this do that i'm going to lose some time and it's going to make the technician's job a little bit more tedious so back to the engagement thing so here here's a load cell setup and tension heather did a nice job on the you know these drawings they're putting out different marketing materials but we have a tension member value kit and we have a clevis kit. This top red piece, this piece can come off, and we have a video on this, and can screw right into the clevis. So you could be calibrating a load cell, and then you could turn around and tension, turn around and calibrate a uh, tension link. Different hardness of top adapters, mentioned it earlier. The produce error as high as 0.03. This is an example of 0.3. Here you have it, all I'm talking about, same load cell here, really old load cell, single column cell. Two different, same base plate, if we're looking at base plates, just varying the difference of that top adapter and hardness, and you can see a 0 0.307 difference. This was done the same day. I did testing the next day, did testing for about a week on this, found all kinds of errors. So I said, oh, um, and the errors were all related to the hardness. There were some timing errors, but they were rel rel relatively low, meaning like under 0.01. In any case, the, just testing it day after day and re reproducing this hardness of top adapter. Yes, if I use this, I get an error around 0.3. If I use this, you know, I don't. So uh, really important that the top adapter and that hardness is replicated. And then we have kits. People say, hey, I go out and I do concrete machines. Well, if you're not using a uh, top adapter on your load cell to do, you know, calibrate those testing machines, there's a problem. So you should marry the top and bottom adapters. We have a whole compression and solution. This one, this 600K cell weighs, you know, 25 pounds. Uh, the whole kit, top and bottom, ISO compliant, everything's good there. Um, thread depth, talked about this earlier. Remember I said someone sends this cell in without, without top and bottom adapters? Well, here, look at this error. Max error, 1.7% at 600 pounds of applied force between these three adapters. Interesting, right? All goes away if they lock something into place or goes away if they buy or use these type of load, block, load uh, spherical load buttons and send them in with the load cell. However, the ideal solution here is to lock an interval adapter into place. 
Yeah, you're calibrating it. You have a Morehouse UCM. This walks in the door. What do you do? You could have a set of these adapters, and then you could reference them back and tell the customer, hey, we're using these adapters. They have part numbers on them. If you want to replicate it, use by uh, similar, likely by the exact same adapter if you really want to reduce your error source. Other things, bottom adapters, what we're talking about, alignment in the cal machine. How do we align this? We could align our reference cell alignment plug here. This is machine. Technician doesn't have to measure anything. Just drop it in. Ball adapter aligns things. Here for larger load cells, if we get into larger calibrating machines, we have um, an alignment plug here and our, of course, our top adapter here. Then other things, compression adapter solutions, there's button load cells up close. Uh, the adapters approve alignment. You can put those in the cow machine. Also, handheld force gauges. These are a big concern. These are a big safety risk. Anybody that's in a lab knows that if you're stacking weights, that's a problem, right? I I'm paying somebody or I have my technician that's stacking weights and they're playing Jenga. And when you play Jenga, if you've ever played the game of Jenga, you pull blocks out, eventually they fall. Well, these are light wooden blocks that aren't gonna hurt anybody uh, for the most set. I mean, for the most, uh, I know somebody will send me a picture of a huge Jenga thing where, where it would probably kill somebody if it fell over, if they're doing it with construction tools or whatever, but uh, construction machines. So in essence, when we're playing, when, when our technicians are handling weights, 10, 20, 30, 40 pounds, what happens when they drop? What happens if they hit a foot? You can shatter your entire foot there. So knowing this, this is a PCM, another example of one of our machines. This is a PCM with these blocks. Uh, these blocks, manufacturers didn't standardize them. Someone say, hey, why are you showing me some Swiss cheese here? Well, manufacturers did not standardize these. So we have all these back plates and we have all these centering distance just to accommodate all of the different handheld force gauges that one might see. This can be used in a cow machine. It can also be used in a PCM. Our PCM is 2,000 pounds and under. Uh, the same thing can be said, uncertainty budgets, all the other stuff. So there we go. There's a PCM load cell and load cell can do. Oh, uh, the PCM, if you're looking for uh, anything under 2,000 pounds that can generate 2,000 pounds of force, the whole way down to five pounds of force, the PCM is a real good solution. Typically, if, someone, uh, if you're looking to set up a force lab, Typically, would say, well, what's the max capacity you want? To, and so, say someone says 100,000, the typical recommendation would be 100,000 in a PCM. Really nice to have the 30K if budget allows. So you have like one machine for, you know, the large capacities, uh, you know, 100K, 20, you know, 100K, 50K, all that. Then you go to the 30 for, you know, 25Ks, 10Ks. 5Ks and then go to the PCM for all the real small stuff. That's ideal. You could also do 100K and uh, PCM and then say, hey, maybe my wish list is the 30, not needed. I know my uncertainties may be around that 03. If I got the 30, I could probably get to the 02. Um, but, you know, that's okay for now. Yeah, and the PCM, like the UCA, can calibrate almost anything. Then we have, this is a bit more custom, put it in here. We make UCMs up to uh, 10 mega newtons or 2.25 million pounds. That's the biggest one we made in our lab. We can make machines that are gigantic uh, and high capacity. You know, many of these high capacity load cells are designed with custom threads or fixtures. So safety and quality control becomes even more important is large capacities. Those mishaps can be life threatening, you know, so more house. You know, we design things. We design things with at least a two to one safety factor. If you're in the lifting business, you know, it's four to one. We try to over design some things. It just depends. It's a conversation with the customer on how big do you want to go. That adapter, uh, you know, we've seen old BLH type cells with eight inch threads to a million pounds. Is that needed? No. It was super safe, but is it needed? You know, going to a million pounds today, you can go four and a half, uh, five inch. We prefer to go five inch because it gives you more safety, but some manufacturers out there are pushing the limits and, and really eking, trying to eke out that uh, two to one. So talking about adapters, communication with the customer's key, uh, examples of you know, third party suppliers, maybe you're dealing with somebody that's having something calibrated for someone else and they don't wanna put you in contact with the end user. So there's a lot of back and forth. Purchasing departments where somebody said, hey, just get this calibrated. Management who does not care. They're just like, just put a sticker on it. That's not great. Uh, large companies where it's difficult to reach the technician. Ideal solution is always.
going to be to calibrate the device with the customer's adapters or have the customer send the appropriate adapters uh, to the reference lab for Cal. Secondary is document what you did, preferably use Morehouse adapters, get the okay by the customer and then go. We have more uh, that can be said about this. We have technical papers on adapters. Um, this one won best, was one of the best papers at NCSLI. Very, very proud of it. So uh, it's in the PDF link if people want to read it. So I have this question. Uh, that you know, uh, to for people to start uh, thinking thinking of here, and I'm going to open open a poll. We have about a minute here. I think Heather's going to get on and read this. Yes. Uh, so we do have a polling question about uh, what we just talked about, and it's about adapters. What should you do if you have older adapters? Um, and so on the right hand side, where you see the chat function, right underneath that, you'll see um, a little section that says polling, and there's four questions there. So you have uh, about a minute or so to answer the question, A, B, C, D, or E. I can see there's already quite a few answers coming in, and we have about 20 seconds left to finish up, and, uh, and then we'll let you know what the answers were. Yeah, so about, about half, well, now we're down to exactly half the people, okay? A little more, so more than half have completed it. Can we get to the 60%? Oh, nope. So we can wait, we'll wait one. Okay, so we're gonna show the poll results. People are still answering. Uh, 19 of 32 have responded. If we get to 20, I'll switch it over, see if the 20, maybe not. So, all righty. So the final countdown, we have more than half respond. So poll results. And hopefully we can share here. So Heather. Yes, we can see those. Uh, so again, if you're in that polling section on the right hand side, you should be able to see the results. Uh, most uh, 15 out of 32 people did answer E, which is the correct answer, which is A and D. And the other uh, folks who answered answered either A or D. So yes, good answers. Okay. Good. And I'm trying to load our next polling question now. Yep. So as he's uh, doing that, well, let's go over the answers here. So A was visually inspect all adapters for any signs of wear or fatigue and replace if they show any signs of potential failure. That is a great answer. If you see something that you don't think is working well, it's probably not. Um, B, I don't think you want to do. Uh, you probably don't want to spend a lot of money to have them tested frequently. Uh, and again, C, continue to use until the adapter fails. Uh, that would not be a good option uh, because you don't want a failure. Uh, so you don't want to continue using them until they fail. Um, and then D is another good option. Uh, replace adapters that have been in use for more than 20 years or 100,000 load cycles or 10,000 calibrations. Uh, so that's another good way, um, both visually inspect and look at how long you've been using it. All right, sounds good. So yeah, Heather covered that nicely. Most people had the right answer. UCM uncertainty, the big thing. Hey, I, I picked out my machine. I know what I want. I, you know, I trust Morehouse here. They've done this for over a hundred years. Where, where am I, right? How do I do this? I get all of it and now I'm dealing with, I wanna bring force into the lab. I'm dealing with accreditation. I'm dealing with best practices. How do I do an uncertainty budget? So what is the best uncertainty I can achieve? Can, can achieve, you know, uh, like I said, our machines can achieve a measurement uncertainty of better than O2 of the applied force. You need to do standard changes with that. Um, and the other thing is depends on several fast factors. We must look at uh, significant contributions to measurement uncertainties. If I'm doing a repeatability study with bad adapters or misaligned, my repeatability might not be so good. So I, you know, back to adapters there for, for that. But when we start looking at uncertainty propagations, we wrote this paper uh, a while ago and uncertainty propagation for forced calibration systems. We start looking at the tiers. Here's, here's dead weight, tier zero is dead weight. Tier one might be a primary lab where the load cells calibrated to primary standards. And this is what we're showing. This is from 20% of the cells capacity. So if I have, you know, just, I like easy round numbers. If I have 100K UCM and 100K uh, you know, ultra precision, Morehouse ultra precision load cell, and I'm doing my test, 
what we're showing here, and we did this in our lab, is we're showing we are getting at the 20%, sorry, I'm keeping the highlighter on, at 20% force point, we're getting 0 0.019, so 0 0.02. At capacity, we were getting numbers like, you know, 0 0.005. But this is the one that, this is our highest uncertainty. So if we want to go lower, we're going to have to change our standards, which means if I want to apply, if I want to maintain better than 0 0.02, I'm going to have to do a standard change in here or a machine change or some kind of a combination of, of whatever you want to do. If you went down to 10%, you started getting down to the 03. That might be good enough. You know, it just depends on the application. And then we just hypothetically ran, hey, if what's the absolute best I could get? Assuming everything stays consistent, my repeatability and everything else. If I go to the next tier now, the absolute best I could get mathematically was 0 0.03, which means I've calibrated with dead weight. Now I've put the cell in a cal machine and calibrated it. Now I'm going to put it in another machine. So when you think about it, let's go to the next slide and explain this better. When you think about it, right here's the dead weight, right? So I've calibrated this load cell. Then I've gone to an accredited, then it's gone to an accredited cal supplier. The best that they can give me is point. 0, 0.03 from that drawing. It was 0, 0.31. And that's under the absolute ideal conditions. So if you don't have your standards calibrated with dead weight, assuming they are doing everything as best as they possibly can, and they're not, uh, there's errors everywhere, none of us are, the best you could possibly get is 0, 0 0.03. But if you go back to dead weight, you can do better. You can get to the 0 0.2. Just a, a, another plug for dead weight. But typical uncertainties, here you can see them. Uh, NIST, this is K equals 1. That's one standard. It's uh, standard uncertainty. Uh, accredited cal supplier, working standards, field measurements. And you, you can start seeing some of these. You know, if they're at 0 0.2, the best they can give you is 0 0.3 under the best conditions. And as I said, it just doesn't happen. So yeah, there's adapters. Uh, again, we're looking at how easy they are to change. And here, accuracy is not a method of validation. It's something that we put in here. Uh, you know, many calibration laboratories have standard practices to use accuracy as a method of validation. When the device does not meet the specification, the technician will adjust it in their machine, which has unknown errors to meet the tolerance requirements. Now we're doing an adjustment. The main problem with this method is that you will not know the calibration lab used to deem the necessary adjustments. If you use, so they're not using the right adapters, they're using, you know, whatever machine, and then they're adjusting it. How do you know if they did the right job? You know, they might call something in intolerance that's not intolerance, right? And that's, we all deal with this case of accuracy, which is a function of, you know, precision Precision and uh, bias, and bias can be thought of as your measurement error, and precision is how well things repeat. So that's our spread. Are they making multiple measurements? Are they using the right things? This is where we've kind of, with the CAL machine, with the adapters, we've solidified this. So when you make that measurement, you should know your measurements within that O2, right? If you make a conformity assessment, someone sends you the device to point one, and you're using you, you should know whether you're in or out of tolerance. You shouldn't have to worry about it. Force uncertainty, you know, there you go. And it's a little joke here, you know, getting into trouble with the apple, uh, then Newton, apple falls on his head, you know, and then we have, you know, starting to get it, you know, force equals mass times the acceleration. And uh, there we go. We try to make it easy. Uh, why is, you know, why is measurement uncertainty important? There, that last graph, we were talking about the accuracy, basically that bias and precision. The calibration provider with the lower measurement uncertainty often has much more room to make a conformity assessment. Right, You're using a, when using a Morehouse UCM with Morehouse reference cells calibrated by deadweight standards, you should be able to pass a lot more instruments than using dynamic machines without dead weight. And that's what we're comparing here, right? You're saying, hey, Customer has a device, uh, you know, a 10,000 pound device. They want, we set the limit at plus or minus five pounds. Using one machine, you can get uh, very high TURs and you can have more room from the left and the right here to be in. 
using another machine, you raise the uncertainty to about 05. You can see, yeah, you don't have that much room if you're if, if the instrument reading is 10,004, depending what your decision rule is, you don't have that much room to be intolerant. So that leads us to opening our well, sorry, that leads me to uh, the next poll is it's showing. We'll get to that. I have a five minute timer on it. I thought I thought we were going out there, but we're talking about CMC uh, calibration and measurement capability. It's defined as, you know, um, CMC is a CMC uncertainty is for ILAC. P14 is the document you want to use. It, it often includes repeatability, resolution, reproducibility, reference standard uncertainties, reference standard stability, and environmental factors. Call these uh, five R's and an E. If you start looking at it, this, we have this awesome CMC sheet. It took many, many weekends of my time in life uh, to prepare this. It makes the job easier for our customers. So if you're using this CMC sheet, right, and you just plug it in. Um, I thought I made it pretty well. And then Heather comes along uh, last year. Heather comes along and simplifies it even further and gives it like tabs. So if you have an old one and you want to download the new one, go to our website. The new one has more things to follow. Uh, Heather did some color coding, some definitions, knowing what each cell does. Really just took something that was good and made it great. Also, one of my favorite books uh, by Jim Collins, Good to Great, if you haven't read it. Highly recommend reading it. It talks about hedgehog concepts, which is basically uh, what drives your economic engine? What are you deeply passionate about? And what can you be the best in the world at? And if one of your answers is force calibration does all three, then we start talking, let's get to the machines, let's get to the uncertainties, let's do everything so you can be the best in the world, world at it. And this just simplifies things for everybody. And if you look at this one here, you have a 14.43% contribution when using dead weights for the, your calibration. And if we look at the next one, uh, where we use a accredited cow supplier, that's at le next level down on the pyramid, we have a 95.74% solution. So dra pretty drastic differences here between the two if we're looking at that. And here, try to show it a different way. You look at this graphically, right? You have a uh, 10,000 pound load cell, Morehouse does the cow, 0.41, expanded uncertainty, Morehouse CMC, 0.16, repeatability this. Uh, the accredited cow supplier does it, they're at 04, say, uh, and then they do, you know, their CMCs, four pounds at that. Just look at it uh, and let it sink in. If you're gonna have your references calibrated by somebody, or you're gonna put those references in another machine to do calibration, right? What, where do you want to send them, right? This all points back to sending, you know, starting with primary standards. So, and expanded uncertainty when calibrated with primary standards is approximately 10 times lower than using secondary standards. If you're making force measurements, primary st standard calibration might be a must. So measurement uncertainty, those that see this and that poll is up for them, it is our next slide, I jumped the gun. Uh, and we'll have enough time to answer it. So measurement uncertainty graphically, here we go, the nominal true value, that's that green line here. You have your uh, measured value, uh, you have your true value, which is, you know, the if you're using dead weight, 10,000 pounds, we know it to, do we still have some error, we know it to 0.0016%. And then you have your uncertainty, and then you have your tolerance specifications. So when we look at this, it means that we are 95% confident that the measured value falls within the interval measured value plus or minus U. And that's what we're showing graphically. So with that said, we have our next poll, which I'll pass to Heather. We have a you know about a minute, 10 seconds to answer. So what is the yep. risk? Yep. Yes. So the next poll question, again, go over to the right hand side right underneath the chat and you can pull it up there. It is what is the risk of not working with Morehouse? Um, and it looks like we did already get some answers here, but we do have about 30 seconds left in the poll. So answer either A, B, C, D, or E. Um, a is I may not get the support I need regarding proper met metrological practices. 
Uh, B is I'll get the equipment that works, so other things will not matter as we can put some stickers on them. Uh, C is uncertainties may not be calculated correctly, and we may provide measurements that are not correct. Um, D is other companies offer dead weight calibrations and my ILCs to help meet my needs. And answer E is A and C. Uh, it looks like that poll has just ended. And similar to the last one, we did get a lot of answers that were E, which is correct. Um, A and C would be the two correct answers. Yeah, thanks, Heather. So I have, we're going to close out. I'm going to launch um, as we talk this one, this next poll. I'm just going to okay. open it. It's yep. So the next, the next poll question is uh, related to future webinars. Would you be interested in uh, a webinar on the uncertainty guidance for Morehouse UCMs? And you can answer either yes, no, or maybe, and that'll help us plan for future webinars. Yeah, if enough people answer yes. So we're going to talk about that, the guidance document that we have a little bit, and that polls five minutes. So that's going to run us to the end, and we're going to do some questions and answers. But if you're interested, we have the guidance document available. Uh, went over the CMC sheet. That's an Excel sheet that you can download that, like you said, Heather's, Heather's added some things. If you have the old one, she's added a lot of things to make it even, even easier. And we have this online and it's a guidance document on how to develop an uncertainty budget for Morehouse calibration, you know, calibrating machine. And then we also have, if, if it's just not, this is specific for cal machines, PCMs, all of that stuff. And if it's just not specific and you just want to do for force measurement, A2LA, uh, we worked with A2LA, wrote the document, had uh, as part of the MAC committee, that's measurement advisor committee, had a lot of people help on that document. So if you're making force measurement and you're not using like one of our machines or whatever, or you're going out doing other things, that document gives you four cases on force measurement. You can use the Excel sheet with, with that document and that can help you do your uncertainties as well. We have webinars on that that's published online. What we do not have is the webinar on specifically this document. As you can see, there's 29 pages on this document to break it down and explain it and help people. So if you have a cow machine or you're thinking about getting a cow machine and you'd like to attend that type of webinar, just please uh, give us the poll result. So common risk with most force calibration laboratories and machines, CMC values, that's that uh, calibration and measurement capability and certainty are unrealistic. Uh, Morehouse reports and help customers calculate realistic CMCs, rewrote the guidance documents on how to do them. So would you rather go with someone that's trying to sell you something, or would you rather go with someone that's trying to help you be better? Um, lack of understanding the standards. We helped draft several of them. We're on several committees. Not properly evaluating measurement risk. And I, I, going back, uh, yeah, there are people on these committees that don't don't follow the standards too. So. Yeah, that's also something to, to be aware of. Just because they're on a committee doesn't mean they're doing this, the things properly. Uh, not properly evaluating measurement risk or probability of false accept. That's from ANSI Z540.3. Uh, we report PFA and we have a tool to help our customers. That's going to be launched on the website at some point. That's an Excel sheet that does method five, method six. We're adding some uh, additional things to it. We all we have a lot of things coming out. A lot of really cool Excel sheets to help people. Uh, we have one coming out to help generate B coefficients. That's something else we may uh, do a webinar on. Uh, the lab does not replicate how the instruments are used by using the right adapters. This is huge. This is uh, you know we talk about UCMs a little bit, but it's really about adapters. You know what what are, adapters are you using with your cal machine, and how could is your vendor to supply you with the right and proper ones so you can replicate or give the customer the best chance of replicating that measurement. So we ask these questions, always seek to replicate use and provide adapters to solve measurement challenges while reducing setup times. Uh, making better force measurements start with using the right equipment such as Morehouse force machines, dead weight, UCM, PCM, Using the right calibration provider who has the measurement process and certainly capable of meeting your needs and follows published standards. Making sure the calibration replicates how the instrument is being used by using the right adapters to ensure results are repeatable. Working with a company who helps you calculate your measurement uncertainty correctly. This is a big one. I don't know how many people are out there. You know, I can't see everybody in video, but 
if you look at uncertainty budgets, they're all over the place. You know, they all do it differently. So we're hoping to standardize that and then measurement risk and cares about the measurements you make. We care about it. Yeah, we don't want, you know, we don't want you to be making bad measurements. I don't think anybody does. And then, you know, lastly, as, as we have that question uh, there and we're gonna close and take questions, uh, Lastly, you know, if you're unsure, if you've seen this and you're doing force calibration, you're unsure how good your measurements are, we can help with an ILC, calibrated load cell and dead weight. You get it back, you can do your own internal ILC, no one else has to see it, right, to improve your process. You get that load cell back, put it in your machine and see, hey, I got an error of 05, why? What am I doing wrong? Is it alignment, is it adapters? Once you have the right adapters, you can backtrack. So we have about 15 seconds left on the on the poll and then we'll show the response. But the ILC is one of the best things for force or you don't like if you don't know how good you are, you can even rent a cell calibrated in dead weight capacity and and put it in your machine. And then, like I said, you can backtrack the answer. Well, what if I do this? What if I do that? You can use it as a training for your technician. Use all kinds of things. SPC, statistical process control. If you wanted to buy a good load cell, have it calibrated in dead weight. That means you could take reference checks every month. I could put it in. I could check different technicians against each other. So lots of good things there. Um, so we're going to show poll results here. And we had 21 people out of the group. Uh, and there's some people that we have 60 some here. Uh, we had 23 answer no no's. So we can we can help. Um, we we can work on that. Uh, if enough, they said if enough people are interested. Wish everybody was here out of the 60. This is what you get when you run webinars. But you know, we have a third of them that are saying yes, and maybe the other ones. Who knows? Uh, in any case. So with that said, it is summer. So watch for a couple of things. I wanted to say, watch for uh, the new issue of Metrologist. There should be an article in there on adapters from us. There's also a book review, something that we never thought we'd be doing, but we uh, are writing book reviews on uh, the actual book reviews, Atomic Habits. We will be at HOA's Tech Forum presenting one of the best values for your money. That's August 1st through the 4th is the HOA Tech Forum because you get three full days of training and it's very a la carte. You can go to whatever you want. It's not, it's one price, a very reasonable price for the week. You get to network and meet a lot of people. We'll be there. We're, pre we're presenting August 4th on how to help uh, it's for auditing force calibration labs, how to, how as an auditor, if anybody's an auditor, how you can help your customers and the make them give suggestions to them to become better uh, when you're out doing the audit. Or if you're uh, a lab, you use that and say, hey, I can use all these. The auditor should tell me I can use them too. And then we're taking a little bit of break for the summer. We're going to be very active with blogs, some things coming out on accuracy and some other other stuff we're working on because we know people have summers. And then we're going to come back September 8th with a new webinar after the NCSLI show. We'll be at NCSLI in August. We're going to come back with a webinar, uh, Resolution Impacts Risk, Best Practice Versus Outdated Calculations. So that is more of a global topic for anybody. If you have friends that are in quality, that argument is always there. Should I include the resolution of the unit under test in my uncertainty? And we're gonna answer that question. We're gonna provide the guidance that tells you, we're gonna give examples. Uh, there's cases where uh, people are you know, 30 to one. Hey, I can meet this if I use a simple TAR calculation, but when you use TUR, you're less than one to one. For those that know what that means, well, it's, that's test accuracy versus test uncertainty. We'll go into all of that uh, that presentation, and then we'll sort of schedule on webinars. And we like likes, we like people following us. We post lots of content. Heather's posting Funny Friday content. We're posting articles that help you make better measurement. We're posting quality articles, force articles. We just posted a torque one on LinkedIn. So uh, adding videos, we just posted a video on our 4215 uh, high stability. Uh, we got rid of our older 4215 meters, replaced it with high stability. Video shows why, because it's twice as stable as the old ones. So all that said, if you follow us on these social platforms, you'll get, you know, uh, as we put out the content, you'll get it immediately. And if you subscribe to our newsletter, Heather sends that out once a month, you'll get that.